Suppose we define the Hermit polynomials using their generating function. Can you then show that the following equation holds? Sure you can. Just pause the video and unpause when you figure it out. So let's recall the generating function in this case. So a generating function is a function of x and t. And for the Hermit polynomials, that takes the form exponential minus t squared plus 2tx. And by definition, when we expand this in the Laurent series with powers of t, with n going from 0 to infinity, the coefficients there are the Hermit polynomials of order n as a function of x, with an extra n factorial that we throw in, throw in here. So this is the definition of Hermit polynomials using a generating function. Now, in order to have an explicit formula for the Hermit polynomials, we somehow need to change this equation here, this exponential, into a summation, into a series expansion, where we have different powers of t. So that's our goal. Now, the way we're going to do that is by realizing that we can write this here as a product of two exponentials. And then for each of these exponentials, we're going to write down its series expansion and then rearrange terms such that we have an explicit formula for the coefficient of t to the power of n. And once we have that, then we're in business. Okay, so let's take a product of these two series expansions. For our first factor, we have a summation of r going from 0 to infinity. And then we need the argument of our exponential, so that's minus t squared to the power of r divided by r factorial. And then we do something similar for our second factor, so a summation, and then the argument this time is 2tx to the power of r divided by r factorial. Right? Everybody happy? So hopefully now I hear a huge uproar because what I've done here is of course a terrible mistake. You know that if we take a product of two series expansions, then we should really pay attention to the fact that we use a different summation index for the second factor, like so. Because otherwise we basically miss most of the terms. In case that's not clear to you, just revisit some of our uh, older videos where we talk about how you should take the product of two, two series expansions. Okay, so now that we've avoided that pitfall, let's just rearrange this such that we can write it in a form where we have an explicit formula for the coefficient of t to the power of m. So what powers of t do we have here? We first have t to the power of 2r, and then we multiply that by t to the power of s, so this together should be n. So if we make that substitution, then we basically have moved from independent summation indices r and s to coupling them through this new summation variable n. So now we have three summation indices. That's just one too many. So let's get rid of one of those. So let's say let's get rid of s and write everything in terms of r and n. So if you were stuck, this perhaps was a good hint. So hopefully now you're back on track. So if you want, just pause here and uh, have another go. The most tricky part here is trying to come up with the correct bounds for our summation indices. So one way we can do that is by taking a look at the variable that we've eliminated, which is s in our case, and write that as a function of the other summation indices. So we get s is equal to n minus 2r. And we know that s actually starts at 0. So s has to be a positive number. And from that, we can conclude that 2r should be smaller than n. Or we can also write that r is equal to this particular quantity, which is the integer just below or equal to n over 2. So that's a purely algebraic way of coming up with uh, the new bounds. There's another way of doing that, uh, which is slightly more instructive, I think, which is based on a diagram like this. 
Again, have a look at previous videos if you want a reminder of where this thing is coming from. So we have our two summation indices, R and S, and each of the crosses in that diagram over here corresponds to one term in the product of our series expansion. Okay, so we have them like that. And we should make sure that when we rearrange and reorder different terms, that we do not miss any of those terms. So, um, our new guy on the block is our summation index n. So what are the values of n in this diagram? Well, let's first have a look at this uh, line over here, where s is equal to 0. So n will just be 2r. So we will have 0, 2, 4, 6. These are the s values for the first line here. If you now move up one line, we have a situation where s is equal to 1. So we just add 1 to the values we had on the row below. 1, 3, 5, 7. And then we keep going. 2, 4, 6, 8, 3, 5, 7, and 9. So now we have an idea where the different values of n are located in this diagram. Let's collect them. Let's see where we have n is equal to 0. So n is equal to 0 only appears once over here. Same thing for n equal to 1. That also only appears once there. Um, but it's different for n equal to 2 because there we have two guys contributing. And here we have also for 3, two terms contributing. So you see that they basically move in, uh, in pairs, which is of course related to, to what we have up here, this integer uh, smaller than or just equal to n divided by 2. So this diagram illustrates how we should do bookkeeping of rearranging this so that we have a, uh, a summation where n is running from 0, from 0 to infinity. So n running from 0 to infinity basically means we work our way through this diagram like this. And then for a given value of n, for a given value of n, let's have a look at what happens to r. So r is along this axis here. So let's say, for example, we start here and then r increases like this or like that or like that. And then every time you indeed see that r runs from 0 to the integer just below or equal to n divided by 2, which confirms what we had in the purely algebraic uh, derivation. So that's good news because that's the hardest part done. Uh, now we just need to collect all of the different terms here. So again, g, x, t. And then we have a summation of n running from 0 to infinity, t to the power of n. And then for each value of n, we will have a summation of r running from 0 to this funky upper bound here. So let's collect some terms. Um, so yeah. First over here, we have, of course, uh, minus t squared to the power of r. So the only thing that, that's left here to look at is this minus 1 and then this r factorial. So we will have minus 1 to the power of r, minus 1 to the power of r, divided by r factorial. And then going back to our second series expansion, uh, what's left here is 2x to the power of s divided by s factorial. But we've gotten rid of s, so we should replace s by n minus 2r. Okay, let's do that. We have 2x n minus 2r divided by n minus 2r factorial. And that we know is equal to the summation of n going from 0 to infinity, by definition, I would say, of t to the power of n, our Hermit polynomial of order n x divided by n factorial. By the way, you might wonder why we have this n factorial here in the definition. That's basically just yeah convention, but it will allow for the fact that then all of the coefficients of our Hermit polynomial are nice integers, but uh, that's a different exercise. And yeah, now we're basically in business. We have the final solution. We can easily read that 
the best that um, the Hermit polynomial of order n can be written as a sum of r going from 0 to n over 2 minus 1 to the power of r, r factorial 2x n minus 2r n minus 2r factorial multiplied by n factorial. And there we have it. That's an explicit form for the Hermit polynomials. So you clearly see that these are polynomials because the summation terminates for a finite upper bound here.